Yeah, that and physics. Yeah. Right, but I thought I'd talk on a different topic. I thought I'd talk on random uh, simplicial complexes and their fundamental groups. So that's the, yeah. So, um, <coughs> fundamental groups of uh, random simplicial complexes Okay, so this is a, a project that I've been working on with um, Matt and uh, and Chris for some time now. So uh, with um, <coughs> Hoffman and Kale. Okay, so uh, let me just uh, start by indicating uh, what the setup is, what it is that we're looking at. So, <coughs> so I'm going to build a random space, and then I'm going to look at its fundamental group. And actually, there are several different ways to build random spaces. And uh, I'm going to start with this uh, random simplicial complexes. And the place I first saw this was uh, uh, Lineal and Meshulam. That's quite a natural uh, way to build a random space. And you just start with um, <coughs> the simplex. And the notation, I'll take uh, delta n. Uh, sub so i will just mean the i skeleton of the simplex on vertice x set 1 through n. And then I'm going to look at um, uh, two dimensional uh, subcomplexes of this that contain all the uh, edges. So, uh, so my Sigma algebra will just be the set uh, YM, which is just the set of uh, subcomplexes <coughs> that contain uh, the full one skeleton. And most of the time when I uh, use subset here, these will actually be as subcomplexes. Uh, okay, so that's what I'll mean. Okay, and then we want some uh, um, probability uh, distribution on them, so some, some measure um, mu and alpha, <coughs> and it's indexed by some parameter, which is the probability with which I toss in each uh, face. So this is a um, probability measure on yn, um, with, as I say, each face. Uh, and each face is going to be included iid uh, with probability n to the minus uh, alpha. Where my parameter comes in, or in other words, that is to say, um, uh, if I take uh, the measure of any particular uh, singleton here, um, which I mean, this is finite, so I just use the discrete sigma algebra, so uh, is just given by uh, um, n to the minus alpha times its number of two faces. This gives me a chance to write down this notation f sub i of x is the number of i faces. And uh, times, of course, 1 minus uh, n to the minus alpha times the number that aren't there. Same thing I said about. OK, so that's my model for uh, random uh, space. And now I'm going to consider this one model. Yes? What, what is y to the n? It's the set of uh, um, complexes. So uh, I guess I'm just asking the notation. I can't read it very well. Oh. Uh, yeah, delta n one is contained in x, and it's contained in delta n two. That's the difference. One and the two. Yeah, so we've got all the edges. Put in some of the triangles. That's what it means. Okay. So no further demand for y four. Okay. All right then. Um, <coughs> so then results of the form uh, something asymptotically uh, almost surely true or. Uh, or some threshold. So let me do a little bit of notation for that, and then I can write down some of the facts. So uh, definition, if we have one of these families, so mu n alpha is a family of uh, um, probability measures on uh, some spaces uh, yn. Um, 
And uh, so n is a positive integer, alpha is real, whatever. OK, so um, <coughs> if we have such a family, then I can talk about things being asymptotically almost surely. Then a property uh, p holds um, uh, asymptotically almost surely in um, uh, this uh, measure space. And to indicate which parameter I'm taking to infinity, I'll just write it as mu infinity alpha. That'll be my notation. Uh, if um, uh, the, the limit you know, as n as that thing I wrote as infinity goes to infinity of uh, this property is going to one, so the limit as n goes to infinity of the uh, probability in this uh, mu n alpha of my property uh, within the space on which it's defined uh, is uh, one. So this is something happening asymptotically almost surely. I suppose sometimes I, I might say that it's actually happening at alpha. Although that's part of my notation, so I don't really need to put that. <laughs> and then the other uh, thing that will be uh, relevant is when we have a threshold. So something holds asymptotically almost surely if you remove a little bit of epsilon and, and uh, not otherwise. So uh, and uh, uh, theta is a uh, threshold. Sorry. Alpha is a uh, threshold uh, for um, our property uh, p in uh, this uh, measure space, infinity alpha. Um, if uh, <coughs> when I subtract epsilon from it, it's, it's asymptotically almost surely false. And when I add epsilon, it's also asymptotically almost surely true. So for all uh, epsilon uh, bigger than 0, um, uh, uh, P holds AAS for um, mu alpha plus epsilon, and uh, not P holds minus epsilon, and I might switch. Wait, it's plus or minus. Sorry, could you pull the board down again? Yes. Say what the, the probability of including a phase is what again? End of the minus alpha. Um, a two phase. And that's the probability that it wasn't. So you've chosen that sort of growth with n. And I presume that uh, that's because that's the interesting sort of growth with n. Yeah, it depends on the most interesting. It's the one we can say something about. And but it's I also the more, it's, in some ways it's interesting, but there are certainly questions that happen at a finer scale. Uh, so, with, so with log terms and whatnot. This is in some ways the interesting but coarse uh, growth that we're looking at. Okay. Does that answer your question? There are finer questions that are more that are also interesting that I'm not going to be addressing by but looking at this growth. Right, but not completely different questions. Like you're taking a power of n rather than some other crazy function of n. I don't know. Right, like a Either constant or. or uh, not doing, that's not right. That. And that would not be that, that would not be interesting because everything would go to zero or something like that. Yeah, for most of the questions that I'm asking, that's correct. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, but this is only interesting point. for So that's, uh, that's the way you motivate degree. why you take the power. <clears throat> so if alpha is a threshold for p, what does it mean to have a threshold for not p? Yeah, it means that I'm not going to be very careful about it. Um, mm -hmm. It would mean you switch these signs, um, and I'm really going to, it's going to be really obvious which one I mean. So, yeah. Does that answer your question? I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> OK. I could say it's a threshold for p or not p, if this is true. How about that? There, how my definition agrees with how I would use it. OK. All right, so there's uh, the, uh, the setup. And then um, there are some facts okay, that, that uh, hold in this setup. So. Uh, now maybe I'll leave the definition visible. So the first one comes from this Linnell uh, and Meshulam, and uh, they looked at uh, sort of homological uh, uh, view of what's going on. And then uh, Wallach got involved also. Okay. So uh, and they uh, give us the following 
fact. Um, actually, this is a slight generalization, but it's a nice one. So for all uh, gamma of finite group, I'm going to get a threshold for uh, where that vanishes. Um, now, alpha equals uh, 1 is a uh, threshold for um, the property that I'll call a P sub gamma, uh, which is just that um, uh, the fundamental, uh, the homology, cohomology with uh, coefficients in uh, gamma is uh, trivial. Another way to say this is just the uh, maps um, as a group from uh, the fundamental group to gamma is um, <coughs> is just one of them, the trivial homomorphism. Um, <coughs> Okay, so that's going to be my property p, and I claim that uh, that one is a threshold for this, of course, in the measures that we're looking at in uh, mu infinity. Can it be? No, it could be. If you don't like that, then this is the definition. Okay. All right, so, so this is a uh, in fact. And uh, so another way to uh, say this, a corollary, would be that um, you can avoid all uh, index k subgroups up to a fixed uh, k. So corollary if, um, so for all uh, k bigger than 1, um, alpha equals 1 is a uh, threshold for um, <coughs> pk. Uh, which is a set of all x such that um, uh, pi 1 x has no index k uh, subgroups. Uh, of course, in the same model. Okay. So this is the picture. So, so that's uh, sort of the homological data. And then there's the actually when the fundamental group itself vanishes. And, and this is most of what we were doing, um, the three people up there. And that says that, uh, that the threshold for where the fundamental group actually vanishes is uh, considerably farther along. Okay, So uh, um, alpha equals a half is a, a threshold. For uh, p uh, pi, let me call it, which is just the set of things where the fundamental group is trivial, uh, of course, in the same uh, measure space. OK, and of course, uh, this could also be phrased up there. This is also equal to um, <coughs> uh, just the intersection over all gamma of uh, p gamma, if I wanted to say it. OK. Right, so this, uh, so in other words, th th these things are happening. We're running out of finite index subgroups, and, and the um, abelianization um, tensor down with any particular FP is, is trivial. If uh, once we get alpha equals 1, that means we have uh, chance 1 over n, so we have about n squared faces. And here we have about n to the uh, 5 halves faces okay, in the thing. This first one makes sense, right, because the rank of the free group the, uh, that we had before when we put in nothing is about n squared. So this is, we're putting in about the rank for these things to happen. Here we're putting in significantly more than the rank. OK, so then there's some uh, questions that might extend this. Um, so the first uh, would be, uh, what happens to the uh, actual homology, the z homology? So uh, is um, uh, alpha equals a half a, a threshold for um, p z, which would be also the intersection of all the uh, gamma finite abelian of uh, p gamma. Right, so, so in other words, what we know is that um, for each uh, abelian group, um, we can make it vanish by making n get very, very large. What we don't know is the relative rate at which those happen. Okay, so this would ask that, that we can have all of them happen at once. 
Does that make sense? I mean, these are, these are all AAS statements, so their limits as n goes to infinity. And, and what we don't know is how fast that's happening. And similarly, of course, we could ask it for the intersection of all finite groups. A threshold for um, the intersection over all gamma finite of uh, P gamma. Okay, and in particular, if uh, there are no uh, um, non-trivial maps to uh, finite groups, then it's not residually finite. So this would uh, imply uh, not residually finite. So this is contained in um, P. Uh, and our f, which is just the uh, set of things such that the fundamental group of x is not residually finite. Okay. Um, so in particular, if this uh, number were larger than a half, if we had a threshold, then we'd have a whole regime where we'd have things that were not residually finite. And I haven't said it yet, but I will momentarily. But uh, one of the other things that we prove is that these are all hyperbolic. So that would be a uh, Surprise if this if this happened before, but we don't know how to prove this. Okay, and then other questions one could ask are, for example, uh, property T. So is there um, alpha um, somewhere bigger than equal to half um, with uh, a threshold for? Um, Pt, the set of all uh, x such that phi 1 of x has a Kajan property. Okay. Some questions that we might hear about. Yes? I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand. Your fundamental groups are always free abelian, and you're basically saying to say that phi 1 is isomorphic to 1 means that there are no cycles. No. Okay. So my fundamental group is uh, um, so my fundamental group is the follow. I, I take I start with uh, uh, just the, the simplex. So it's it's free. Okay. So it's not just free abelian. It's free to start with, right? And then I start adding um, triangles, right? And I can get a, a presentation for any finitely presented group this way. Okay. So it's, so the groups themselves could be quite complicated. As far as, okay. Does that clarify what's going on? In fact. Right, exactly. But but most of them will have small. Well, okay. no, most, of them like most. I'm sorry, I should never have said most there. Right, but uh, <laughs> this is what most is. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, these are questions. These are questions. So one question is, is alpha equal to half? Another one is alpha is one. Anything that's another question. I think, my, OK, I am biasing it by asking it this way. <laughs> this is my guess, okay. based mostly on the fact that these two are, are somewhat similar in feel, and this one is, has much stronger evidence that it's a half, because otherwise we get hyperbolic groups that are not residually finite. That's, yeah. So do I understand it correctly? So far, you have, have no question whose, whose threshold is not either a half or one. Uh, except that's. Uh, I, I don't know where this one should be. Um, I, mean, I mean, unless that turns out to be. To be somewhere else. That's right. We don't. Okay. No, we don't have an answer. We don't have anything we can prove. Right, but, and T might be it might be. Um, actually, I don't have any intuition for whether it should be a, one half or one or somewhere in between. Yeah, That would be my guess. Yeah, I, that, I, I, I haven't done much computer work, so I couldn't. I, and I don't really know how to get at a question like that right. from computer simulations. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, so when you say that the alpha equals one is a threshold for having no index space subgroups, yeah. Does that mean when alpha is bigger than one, there are or there are not index space subgroups? Yeah. So uh, it, it means um, <coughs> when it's a. Uh, um, Bigger, there are not. Hmm? I'm sorry. Maybe you could draw an alpha line. Let me draw an alpha line. Let me do that. Very good idea. So this is, this is in fact, I'm going to want to do this later anyway. So 
here's my alpha, and here's global facts. And later I'll tell you some local facts, but for now, let's look at the global facts. Okay, so um, we have uh, alpha. It's a little bit confusing because I often work with one over alpha, which changes everything. So, um, but uh, let me get it clean here. So uh, <coughs> alpha, so I'm going to put the alpha equals a half over here, alpha equals one over here. Okay? Right. Um, so uh, inside uh, here, our, uh, our group is actually free. Okay, and uh, what happens is that uh, there's a, the whole thing, the whole complex collapses to a one-dimensional complex. Okay, there's a, there's a collapsing. Okay. So this is where the um, probability is, um, it's low, so we don't have very many triangles. So this is few, many. Okay, so this is the picture. Okay, and uh, <coughs> then we cross uh, this threshold, and, and then we have um, uh, no uh, finite, uh, no index k subgroups. Okay, for each fixed k. So of course, again, you have to be careful because we're taking your fixed k and then take n to infinity, and then, then you have that situation. Okay, and then over here we have trivial. Okay. So this is that's the picture. Is that clearer? I mean, another way, uh, also in here, of course, we have that the um, homolog uh, H1 with, uh, say, Zp coefficients is trivial. Okay, so that's part of what's going on in the middle there. Can you think of another thing aside from property P that might fall in that range? Well, that's a good question. Um, there are other things that do happen. So, uh, for example, um, some uh, some um, Z twos appear at uh, uh, five thirds, um, and there's a reason. I mean, so locally, what's happening is is quite different. So, if you look at finite subcomplexes, this is what I mean by locally. Then things are changing. So, back here um, locally, we get the the biggest things are are finite size trees of uh, edge connected components. That's why we can collapse them all down. Once we get into here, we start to see other things. And when we get to 5 thirds, we get our first copy of RP2. Uh, this one. We get actually a specific RP2. Just the opposite faces identified. So. Um, <coughs> So when, when we get this, then we get some local two torsion. That sits up and then, yeah. So that's that's what's happening locally there. And here we get any all topological types. I'm getting a little out of order. But, okay. Okay. So does the general progress sort of make some sense now? So let's see, what do I mean by all topological types? That means uh, up to homeomorphism of um, anything that could possibly be there, right? So uh, no, no, not simply connected. There's no reason for them to be simply connected locally. It's a global property. Okay? So. Uh, That's right, it's trivial if it's bigger than one half, right? Yeah. Globally, it's trivial. But uh, locally, it's not. So, but, so if I take a, a finite set of points, so here, here's, a, you know, here's an example. Here's a simplicial complex. The, the fundamental group is trivial, but there's a subcomplex, which is not. It's the pentagon or whatever that is, right? So this says that every uh, topological type of subcomplex, and by every, I mean everything that occurs as a simplicial complex. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Simplicial two-dimensional complex. Sorry. Everything is two-dimensional here. That's right. And, but you're not going to get anything that's not, you know, CW type. <coughs> okay. So does that make sense?
Okay, and actually, since I mentioned it in passing, let me just add this one other theorem that uh, well, maybe I'll talk now briefly about how we prove this. So that inc incorporates one extra theorem. Okay, and then, then what I'd like to do is talk more about other models of uh, random groups, and then I'll probably run out of time, but I, I, I don't know. Or I could talk about the proof. Whichever. Okay, so um, <coughs> vague uh, outline of uh, proof of um, a threshold uh, alpha equals a half for uh, vanishing of the fundamental group. Okay, so um, and, and then I'll go to set it to setting it into a context of other random models. Uh, so <coughs> the idea is the following. So step one. We're going to show that uh, in uh, in this uh, regime, our spaces are uh, hyperbolic. Okay. So step one: um, show uh, that um, if uh, alpha is um, bigger than a half, that's bigger than a half, right? Um, <coughs> then uh, um, X in uh, uh, infinity alpha is uh, AAS hyperbolic. And by hyperbolic, I mean Gromov hyperbolic. Definition. OK. And actually, let me just put a delta here, just because there must be one. Although that delta is um, not a, uh, I'm not claiming much about it right now. OK, and then um, two, uh, now I'm just going to compute. Oh, so should I define hyperbolic? Or people know what that is? Yeah. Define it. OK, yeah, we'll define hyperbolic. And then because step two doesn't make a lot of sense until you know what hyperbolic means. OK, so uh, the definition uh, x is um, a, a delta hyperbolic if uh, whenever I have a uh, loop, In X, uh, with uh, so gamma is a simplicial map. All my maps are going to be simplicial, well, most of them. And um, C, a cycle. Okay, so just some argon that I'm mapping into the thing, and I want to fill it. Okay, um, um, we have. Um, uh, that the area, and I'll define area in length in a moment. Let me just write down the formula that the area, the amount of area that it takes to fill this gamma, is bounded by um, delta, uh, my constant of hyperbolicity, times the uh, length of gamma. And I'll just define what those things are. So the length of gamma is just the length of my cycle, r there, where L gamma is uh, r, this is an r cycle. So if I put in a 15 gon, the length is 15. And then I want to say how many. Two cells does it take me to fill it? So that's the area. A gamma is equal to um, the minimum over all uh, fillings of this. Um, so it's so I'm factoring it through something uh, which is a Van Kampen diagram, um, <coughs> which in particular means that the uh, cylinder on that map is a disk uh, of the. Um, Number of uh, two faces required to fill it. Okay, so that's definition. All right, so that's what it means to hyperbolic. And then what I'm going to do is X try. X means the universal cover. What? X means the universal cover. Good. No, you can do it either way. Okay. Or uh, so in particular, if. Um, uh, is not the trivial, um, then uh, length, uh, area of gamma is infinite. Is that? Make you happy? Is that the? Uh, no? Yeah, so 
feel free to use universal compass too, but, for, but, but I usually do this way, yeah? So maybe it's relevant. What's the threshold for having a horn in a cycle? Well, see, we started with the entire um, one skeleton. So we start out with a lot of cycles, and they never go away. Okay, so the question is just, um, so a, a lot of them, of course, won't be filled, right, until the fundamental group is trivial. But, uh, but there'll be a lot there sitting there to, to check, to test at least. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so let me. I'm uh, sorry. Sorry, I said it wrong, didn't I? Sorry. Yeah, I'll, okay. So I'll, I'll take this to be trivial. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I look at contractible loops that can be filled, so then I don't have to worry about the infinite case. I can just write down the. Okay, so then uh, step two, we're going to actually just build a cycle and show that it, uh, um, it can't be filled with anything that's small enough for it to have this hyperbolicity constant, and, and so it has to be represented on trivial blocks. So that's, that's the progress. So two, um, show that um, uh, I'm going to give a particular one. So this is the cycle of length three. Um, <coughs> And I'm just going to include it into my uh, x. Remember, the vertex set of x is 1 through n, so it makes sense to map uh, each, this vertex to the vertex 1, this vertex to the vertex 2, this vertex to the vertex 3. That's a well-defined map. Okay. And now I can uh, just call it i and compute uh, gamma and compute uh, whether I can find any uh, fillings with area um, 3 uh, delta. And if I can't, then it's got to be trivial. So that has. Um, uh, area of gamma um, uh, bigger than uh, three delta, so uh, delta so gamma is non-trivial. In particular, our fundamental group is non-trivial. This is those are the two steps. So the, the main part is this step one, showing that things are hyperbolic, and then there's this second step. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, we, there is a definition for, uh, for how to uh, compute uh, what this uh, constant is, but it's uh, um, very hard to manage. It's very hard to say. In fact, I'm not even sure it's computable, but it is, uh, it may be computable. But in any case, we, we don't know uh, very much about its growth at all. You mean, you mean delta? delta of alpha, yeah, as a function of alpha. Oh. Yes, and it's a it's a it's a terrible function. Maybe I should write it down. I mean, it's, it's a well. I can write down one bound. We can get a better bound also. But I mean, it, it has to do with how big the hyperbolicity constant you get for building finite size complexes with a certain fixed size, which is an easy function of alpha, but which are themselves hyperbolic and they have some hyperbolicity constant. So then we have to optimize over all the ones of certain bounded size as a function of alpha. So that's, does that make sense? So that's a difficult thing to compute. So you say terrible, you mean hard to compute. So I haven't actually worked out a, so that would be a, a theorem, right, if it were hard to compute. So I, right. I, I, <laughs> I haven't checked that. that uh, but I believe that it grows very fast. And it's also difficult to compute. <coughs> okay. So if this setup, uh, if this is uh, sort of clear, then uh, maybe I'll talk a little about uh, other models, so things where this fits, or uh, and then come back to trying to prove, to outlining more in more detail how we prove this first step that this uh, uh, x is uh, in fact hyperbolic. So 
all, all the models that I know where people look at uh, these fundamental groups uh, can be phrased in terms of uh, finding some um, measure on topological spaces and looking at their fundamental group. It's not too surprising, but in any case, they can be, and so I will phrase them all that way. Okay, so um, uh, let me start by um, introducing some models where I modify the simplex that we started with, the two, two skeleton of the simplex, and take some other two, cell, two complex and use that one to build essentially the same thing. So other models um, replace um, the two skeleton of the n simplex, this two-dimensional complex that we took all subcomplexes containing its one skeleton from by, uh, let me call it delta n a b. And the way I want to think about this is that this two skeleton should be thought of as, as taking inside of the free group, I went out to words of length one. Okay, So I took its one sphere. So now I'm going to take the a sphere over here in my uh, um, free group. So that's the view that I want to take with um, vertex set <coughs> words of length a and uh, edge set words of length a plus 1. And uh, faces, these will be two-dimensional faces, um, words of length b. And these are no longer be triangles. They'll be begons. Each a begon. And let me just draw an example. Uh, I, I could tell you the maps, but I think it's easier just to draw an example so it's clear how this works. So. Um, Oh, yeah, so once I replace that, then everything else just goes through as, as, as before. But let me just draw this example. And then it be clear. So uh, delta, um, <coughs> say, 2, 2, 6, OK, something like that. So it's um, <coughs> got uh, an alphabet of size 2, so 0 and 1. And the um, vertices are labeled by words of length 2. So it's got four vertices uh, labeled by words of length 2 in my alphabet of size 2. But it looks like, and then the uh, uh, edges are going to be words of length three, and they'll, um, uh, the map is going to be the, the beginning and end. So there'll be one associated to the word zero zero zero, and it's beginning part of zero and its end part of zero zero. So it goes there. there. Okay. So then you can uh, just compute what they all are. You could add a one onto that, or uh, onto this one you could add another one, or you could add a zero and onto this one. You could add a one, and you get that graph as your underlying one skeleton. <coughs> and then it also has some two faces. In fact, uh, there's one for each word of length 6. So there are 2 to the 6, um, two faces. So let me just draw one of them now so you can see how, how they look. And they're each hexagons, and uh, they're indexed by words of length 6. So something like uh, 0, 1, uh, 1, 0. 1, 1 might be my indexing word for this one. And I'm just going to attach it um, cyclically. So the vertex is 0, 1. The next vertex is 1, 1. The next vertex is 1, 0. And then 0, 1. And then 1, 1. And then it's cyclic. So 1, 0. And then the uh, 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 faces are 4. So let me just draw where it goes. So here's the boundary of my two face. And it's being glued in here somewhere, because this is a two complex. And it just goes uh, there to there, uh, to there, over to there, and then uh, back up here, back over there, and back over there. So it runs around that triangle two times. Okay? So that's the face. Right. OK, so that's typical. Uh, let me draw one more just because there's a nice structure here. There's actually going to be a map between these. And this one is. Uh, words of uh, length 1 in an alphabet of size 4. And this time, the uh, words of length 2. So I can just go anywhere. So it's basically a complete graph, except that I can go either direction. So everything's doubled, and I have loops. So this is going to be the thing that plays a role very similar to the original complex. And uh, Olivier has some nice uh, criteria for when two of these models are very similar, and this one falls into it. So anything we can prove for the simplex model, we can push over to here pretty easily. If I add everything, uh, yes, yeah, 
you have to be a little careful with parity. But as long as you make sure B is odd, then there's no real problem. But I think with this one, it is actually simple connected. Yeah, okay, but modulo some parity thing, all of these guys. Yeah, they all will be. That's right. Uh, it will, um, let's see, B. I, I want B to be bigger than 2A. Yeah, B bigger than 2A. Right, so these are the same. This is a, a, a way to build things. Um, so, and then similarly define um, <coughs> y n and um, mu n. Oh, sorry, associated to a and b and mu n alpha associated to a and b. Okay, so should I say more about this, or is it clear how you do it? So I'm just going to take the full one skeleton, put in the faces uniformly at random with some probability. Actually, actually, let me let me modify my uh, scaling just slightly. So I'll tell you uh, where. Um, mu and alpha a b just tidy, it tidies up some of the formulas uh, evaluated at a particular singleton is um, one minus uh, n instead of to the alpha I'm going to take alpha times b just because it fixes up some of the scaling nicely okay so alpha times b <coughs> to the uh, number of two faces oops one minus this, this is um, the number of uh, uh, non two faces this is uh, two to the uh, n to the b minus um, uh, f two x times n to the minus alpha b, f to x. Okay, so the only thing I've changed is I've rescaled it by b, just for convenience, okay, simplify some formulas. Okay, so this is one class of models that's actually been studied, uh, at least a subset of them have. Okay, so there's some theorems of um, Gromov and uh, Juke and Olivier that, that fit into this model in the case where a is zero, okay? but uh, and then our theorem fit where a is 1. So note, um, uh, so uh, delta uh, 1 um, b n is similar to uh, delta um, uh, n, the two skeleton. Okay? So, so these are. Uh, and, and as I said, they're similar in the sense that we can actually push back and forth uh, theorems about them. But also, you can just see they're almost the same thing. The only problem is that I doubled my edges. If you were to forget about the doubled edges then they, and the loops, then you'd be comfortable. OK, and, um, uh, and now let me give some, uh, some theorems. So theorem, I suppose this is due to, I think it appears, I'm sure it appears in Gromov's papers. Um, Uh, yeah, so let me just say PSH more. So B equals 3 is 4. Yeah, B is, B was, okay, sorry. You are right. Uh, but all our arguments actually go through for other Bs, which is why I made that error. But yeah. Okay, so they have terms about uh, the zero um, case, and let me just try to get. I'm going to mess up my constants. Yeah, so um, alpha equals a half is a uh, threshold for, um, and let me see, uh, uh, p pi. OK, so for some of these models, um, um, in, uh, in the model where we have a zero there, OK? So and let me get the indexing right. So uh, zero b infinity alpha, OK? So this, this model. So this is, um, what does this mean? That means that we just have a single vertex, and we're looking at words of length b in the uh, free group. So that's the case that people have studied. Uh, OK, yeah, good point. So this is uh, usually called the um, length, L, length b relator model. OK, same statement true for the density model, which also fits here. So the density model is the following for uh, and in the density model, which is um, this one. We fix the number of generators here, and then we take the length off to infinity. OK, so this is going to be 0 infinity. Okay, so this is another 
This is the Denson model. Okay, so those, those statements are both true. And, and then the uh, 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 theorem of Juke um, <coughs> studied the. Uh, uh, um, well, let's see, he didn't actually get the. Actually, I suppose it's true. Yeah, so alpha equals a third. I'll get my numbers mixed up. One third or two thirds. One third. So I use a different index than you do. So okay, but uh, alpha equals a third is a uh, threshold for um, property T for um, <coughs> um, well, in uh, the model mu zero uh, three alpha infinity. Okay, which is again a uh, length three relator model. And this he actually proved in, in order to get at um, the fact that, well, he doesn't quite get it as a threshold, but um, alpha um, <coughs> uh, bigger than, less, less than a third, um, uh, then in this model, um, uh, PT holds asymptotically almost surely now in this density model, uh, mu uh, n alpha zero infinity. Okay, and actually this uh, one gets one from the other. Okay, so this is sort of sorry, I'm sort of lost in the indices, but does yeah. this mean you have a class of models where the our vanishing the fundamental group is in one value and the property T is a different value? Yes. Well, I don't juke. It's a juke speak there. Yeah. That's correct. And is the, are these models interesting for some independent reason or because you can prove this about them? That, uh, that is a good question. I, uh, I don't know. I mean, so the, the, other, the other models I'll mention have an independent interest. Um, th this I'm, I'm uh, less clear on. Um, so somehow by, by jacking up from, from zero, up to uh, one, or actually all the higher numbers are fairly similar, so once A is non-zero, then uh, you're somehow building more geometry into it, but I don't really understand how or, or why that would be particularly nice. Right, and so, so the relationship here, so these are related um, by the, the following um, map. If you take um, this uh, n to the s, a, b, then what you can do is take uh, words of length uh, s. Oh, well, let me tell you where I'm mapping it to. I'm going to map it to things of, uh, with um, uh, the alphabet just n. And now each of these uh, um, is a, uh, a word of length um, s. So if I wanted to go this way, I'm going to take my, uh, um, oh, did I write the wrong direction? Yeah, that's right. So my alphabet now is each one goes to a, a, a word of length s. So the lengths get um, multiplied by s. Okay. So an uh, edge. This is no. This is my one example. Where it's not a simple map. Edge goes to a path of length s, and this is an example of it right here. Right. So four is a uh, two squared, and these are two times one and two times three. So this is. Um, let me try to call this map sigma s. So this is uh, sigma 2. And what am I doing? I'm taking a, uh, a path over here, so an edge over here. So let's say I have this edge that goes from uh, 1 to 2. Well, 1 I'm going to take map to uh, a 0, 1. 2 I'm going to map to uh, 1, 0. 3 to 1, 1. And 0 to 0, 0. And then I'm just going to copy that along. So uh, over here, um, that red path is going to be mapped to the path that goes First uh, 0, 1, and then 1, 0. But that's going to be longer, right? So it's going to go 0, 1, and then 1, 1, and then 1, 0. So like so. So, um, okay. so that's going to be the image of that map. In particular, this hexagon was actually the image of the triangle 1, 2, 3 over here. And the point of this is that uh, now we can just pull back the measure because so the paths of the length b go to the paths of length b, and so this, these metrics agree. Okay. So, uh, so the push forward here, the the measure on um, here, um, mu uh, 
and the s alpha a b is just the same as the one that we have over here, mu n alpha s a s b. That's why I chose the scaling the way I did. Otherwise, I'd have to stick an s into my alpha. Okay. So the idea is now that you can use this to sort of push back and forth between your models, and that's what Juke does. So what can I say? So there, uh, let me just make a couple, uh, another question about these models, just a couple comments about other models that I, I know even less about. So maybe even just probably. So th another thing you can do, so uh, a construction of Gromov where he actually built a group that uh, had a property that was otherwise difficult using some uh, random methods. Um, so. Uh, there is a uh, finitely presented group uh, G, um, <coughs> which does not, uh, with uh, Cayley graph, um, not embedding, uh, not uh, coarsely um, <coughs> isometrically embeddable in any um, Hilbert space. OK, anyway, it's just a theorem, but it's a nice theorem. But uh, the, uh, the point is that this is done by a, a method that's somewhat similar, except instead of gluing in uh, cells, you glue in cones on graphs. OK, so that's sort of what replaces it. So that's another random model people uh, look at. So here we uh, um, add uh, cones on uh, graphs other than cycles. In particular, a nice family of expanders is what he uses. And then he uses this extra trick of expanding, like we did here, by, by S. Okay, so this is another class of models. So you can, and, and this model is applied in this setting, where it's just uh, words in a group. But you could do the same thing with these extended ones, where you're mapping into these things instead. So it'd be a different class. What's going on with this group? It's just growing it enormously. Yeah, that's right. So these ex it's an expanding family of uh, of graphs, and what you're doing is you they have some uh, you use them at one the theta one at one scale, then you expand its edges considerably, and glue in theta two at a bigger scale, and that gives you a so what you get is what they call lacunary hyperbolic. So you get different hyperbolicity constants at different scales as the scale gets bigger. That's why it doesn't embed. And then there's an extra little trick to make it. That, so that gives you something infinitely presented, but then you use an old trick in the 60s to get a finitely presented subgroup that has a similar property. OK, so those are a couple models. But then the other models that I can think of and, and know less about are only models that people have looked at homological properties about. And those are ones where you have other models of, of random spaces. And just whenever you have a nice model of a random space, you can ask about its fundamental group. And most of the terms I know are not. They're more about the uh, homology, right? So, you know, so other uh, models of uh, random spaces. Now, let me just list a few. So, th there would be, uh, for example, these. Uh, uh, get the name, but um, these Rips complexes and uh, uh, as associated to a, a metric space with a disk, uh, with a measure and a metric. So, if X has a, a measure. Mu and metric uh, d, um, <coughs> we can build, um, say, uh, Rips uh, complexes. And again, people have studied tax facts about how, you know, Betty numbers, but uh, uh, stability of Betty numbers, and whatnot, but less about what the fundamental group looks like. Yeah, so that's one thing we can do. Uh, another is uh, if we have, um, if x is a uh, smooth manifold. And we have uh, covariance data. Then there's a way to build a uh, uh, measure on the set of uh, uh, functions to R, which is supported on Morse functions. So you get a, a, a measure on Morse functions. So you get a uh, measure on uh, Morse functions. And again, people have said uh, things about um, the Euler characteristic. So there's some work 
of um, uh, Adler and Taylor on Euler characteristic of these things, and also things about the number of uh, critical points of a certain value in very special cases where they have high symmetry on their um, <coughs> on their covariant data. And uh, uh, but I know nothing about the fundamental groups. Okay. And then you can do things with gluing. So that's another thing you can do. So you can uh, glue um, uh, simplices to get pseudo manifolds. I don't know much about that, but um, you could also uh, um, <coughs> glue handle bodies to get uh, three manifolds. And for this, of course, you need to measure. On the side of possible glue lines, that is the mapping class group of your boundary. And I think uh, Thurston and uh, Dunfield have played with that a little bit. And they, they get some, again, homological properties about the thing, about these uh, fundamental groups. So when the, uh, uh, I think the, uh, it's a rational homology sphere or something like that. Maybe even better. Anyway, but, uh, but mostly uh, homological properties. OK, so there are just some other models that pop to mind. OK, so no question about that. Then I wanted to uh, just uh, run out of time. But uh, let me just write one diagram then for uh, how the proof would go, had I more time. OK? So the idea is the following. We have. Um, our um, measure here, and uh, alpha is uh, bigger than a half. Okay, and I want it, and the goal is to show that this is hyperbolic. So that's where we start. And over here, we want to get um, delta hyperbolic. Okay, so let's try to get in between these. So let me start at this end. So one thing I can do is use uh, um, Gromov's uh, local global. Uh, theorem to say that I don't, I can uh, tell hyperbolicity by knowing it locally. So if we have a locally, um, well, let me write it in this order. So 44 uh, delta squared locally, um, 44 inverse uh, delta hyperbolic, then we get that it's actually hyperbolic. Okay? So this means that I just have to look at complexes with at most that many uh, two faces, okay? so sub complexes. It's actually not how he states it, but that's uh, this follows. You have that. Okay. Um, and so what we're going to do over here is show that um, for all k, um, absolute uh, um, <coughs> AAS, as Mark Lama showed is this n here is going to infinity, uh, we get um, <coughs> that uh, our complexes are k locally. Um, now, what we call a uh, Alpha admissible, and uh, we say that um, x is uh, alpha admissible if the number of uh, two faces f2 is uh, less than um, uh, some constant alpha inverse times the number of uh, zero faces. Okay, so we have a small number of facets relative to two faces. So that's this is easy. This is just what what we get. Okay, so that's that's what it means to choose something randomly. Is that locally? We get things with this ratio. That's why. That's where that diagram came from earlier. Right? So that's how you tell where things fall. Why it fell at five thirds? That's the ratio, f two to f zero. Okay. So now we're just going to take k equals uh, forty four delta squared. Oh, by the way, for this theorem to be true, we need delta at least four. Okay. Whatever. Not a big problem for us. So we're going to take uh, that to be uh, that, and then it becomes a local problem. So now I can just look at the local spaces and try to show that this alpha. Um, Admissibility implies this sort of hyperbolicity. And then we're done. So we get um, a locally uh, alpha admissible implies um, uh, delta hyperbolic. And the key here is that this should be a function of alpha. I need this uh, delta to be a function of alpha, <coughs> right? Because uh, otherwise, uh, I, I would. So what I have to do is get this delta to a function of alpha. Then I choose k to be big relative to that. Okay, and then now I'm done. So. Must be function alpha, and what we can prove with some work is that when we have this uh, ratio on all uh, subcomplexes, uh, then um, uh, homotopy type is a wedge of circles t 
two spheres, NRP2s. And therefore, the, the fundamental group uh, is uh, hyperbolic. And since uh, hyperbolicity is a property only of the fundamental group, that means that the space is hyperbolic. The problem is that this hyperbolicity constant that we can get here is, is not in any way linked to alpha. So we don't know how to link it to alpha in this setting. So now we have to do something to get over to here. And uh, I'm afraid I'm running out of time. So uh, let me just uh, say in, in words um, that we define two types of behavior of a, uh, a disk. There's a sort of a almost embedded behavior and a sort of crumpled up behavior. And that crumpled up behavior depends on the hyperbolicity constant of local pieces. So that's why the uh, eventual constant is going to depend on the hyperbolicity of complexes that satisfy this type of criterion and have a small number of faces. But anyway, there's some work to do to show that, but uh, that's how it works. So um, <coughs> I suppose I'll uh, stop there for some other time.